Tassa Bhagavato Virahato Samma Samvittasa Today's Sutta continues on the theme that we've been discussing during the past several weeks. Last week we discussed the Salayatana, the six sense spheres. Prior to that, I think we were talking about the asavas, mental contaminants. Today we'll talk about the Majje Sutta. Majje means the middle, the middle, the one in the middle. This one is also from the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. From the Book of the Sixes, Sutta number 61. Majje Sutta is uh, in English translated as the discourse on the middle, the middle. Here we have a, a get together, if you will, of senior bhikkhus. during a full moon day. Bhikkhus who have come together to discuss a certain verse that they have heard being spoken. And it is from the Sutta Nipata, which is, many people uh, agree that it is probably the oldest set of suttas that were available even at the time of Lord Buddha. Suttas or discourses that were given by him, which the community of bhikkhus had uh, memorized. So there's a conversation that had taken place where a certain Brahmin had asked the question and Lord Buddha has responded. So it is the verse from that particular sutta that we find in the Sutta Nipata, which is the group of suttas, discourses it's called, basically. And it is interesting from each of these venerable ones' responses, we get to see their personalities, individual personalities in understanding and deciphering as to what this particular verse would mean to them. Even though on the surface they're coming from different angles, yet we see how they all get it. They all understand it. And in the sutta, we don't see the mention of them being arahats. But one has an inferential uh, understanding or knowledge or feeling at least that they're, if they're not there, they're pretty close, pretty close. It's a beautiful sutta. It's not a long sutta, but it is beautiful in that it's simple and uh, very much part of our lives. The things that they hit upon, the different angles from which they come to decipher, understand, and interpret the verse that was spoken by the Buddha. Each of them reveals a new layer, a different nuance to reality as such, the way we can come to also become privy to their view, their understanding, and perhaps take that with us in understanding our own life and in connection to the Dhamma, to understand the Dhamma through our lives, because there's no other way to understand the Dhamma other than one's own life, one's own particular experiences. So with that, let us begin. Majje Sutta Anguttara Nikaya 6.61, Book of the Sixes. This is what I personally heard 
At one time, the Blessed One was living in the Deer Park at Isipatana in the city of Benares. That is Sarnath, the city of Sarnath, where Lord Buddha taught the Dhamma Chakra Pavattana Sutta. It was at that time when many senior bhikkhus had gathered after having already returned from the alms round and taken their meal, as they now sat together in the circular hall, discussing and sharing their thoughts thus. Friends, this was the response given by the Blessed One in verse to the questions of Metteya, as found in the Parayana Vagga. Parayana Vagga is uh, a section from the Sutta Nipata. So this is the verse. He who, having understood both ends, the one with wisdom, who does not get attached to the middle. It is he whom I call a great man, for he has bypassed the seamstress in this world. Now, friends, so this is where they are trying to uh, take it apart, if you will, as to what these words mean meant. Now, friends, what is the one end? What is the second end? And what is the middle? And who is the seamstress? Seamstress, as many of you know, is a person who works, you know, with a prop today, sewing machine, stitching things together. So she's the seamstress, the tailor, if you will. So who is the seamstress? When this was said, one of the bhikkhus said to his fellow senior bhikkhus, this is his interpretation. Friends, contact is the one end. The arising of contact is the second end. And the cessation of contact is in the middle. Whereas craving is the seamstress. So you have on one end, contact. On the other end, you have the arising, the beginning of contact. And in the middle is where it ceases. It is craving that keeps stitching for him and you re-becoming here and there. Friends, by knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood. And as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, he thereby puts an end to suffering. In order for the seamstress to come in, craving in this case, according to this Venerable One's uh, interpretation, craving being the seamstress, in order for her, uh, why, by the way, we say her because tanha, has the feminine uh, rendition in Pali, Tanha, because it has a diacritical mark on top. So it's the feminine version. That's why we use the uh, her for she, female, for craving. So in order for craving to come in and stitch, it needs to cut out something. In order for her to stitch together, in this case, contact, and the arising of contact. There needs to be some type of a relationship built other than what reality is presenting the person with. So it is craving itself that is responsible for re-becoming, or in Pali, we use the term pono bhavika. That is the thing which drags a person from life to life in samsara but not necessarily, it shouldn't necessarily be looked at simply in reference to samsara from one life to the next. It could be also uh, in relation to the microcosm of, of the person's life as the person jumps from one thing to the next, from one interest to the next, which we often uh, describe in the case of dukkha as dissatisfaction or unsatisfactoriness. 
Why? Because the person jumped on this, pounced on this after so many trials and tribulations. Once they have it, it slips through their fingers, or at least the interest does. Now they want to go and chase after something else. Well, why? Because the person has this, uh, well, they're, they're in prison. They're imprisoned and the jailers are delight and uh, uh, lust basically and, and disgust, repulsion, wanting to run away from one thing to the next. Delighting here, now, well, a little bit later, delighting over there. But the seamstress does this stitching job of hers in such a rapid, quick manner, where we don't even know what happened. There's a quick succession. If you could just think about a sewing machine and how fast it goes in and out, it goes in and out, goes in and out. You have to be extremely careful if your fingers are close to the needle going up and down as it stitches multiple levels, usually two pieces of fabric together to create that seam. But it does its job so well, seamlessly, if you will, undetectably, because we don't have manasikara, we don't have the attention placed on it. So when you have contact, you also had basically the object, now you have a subject. I am touching this. I am seeing this. So now you have I introduced. That's where the seamstress has done her job very well. Instead of seeing that contact taking place and that's it. You drop it like Bahia. There's just a seeing. There isn't an I seeing it. There isn't it is touching my body ness or i am touching it ness there's none of that there's just a touch there's just a seeing lord buddha had a term he used to use putto bikave vedeti putto here is uh, contact he says because of contact, because one feels, Vedeti is feeling, from where we also get Vedana, which is feeling or sensation. And then he continues, Puto Sanjanati. Because of contact, he perceives, perceives. And because of contact, Puto Cheteti. Because of contact also, he intends, wills, chetana comes from there. So contact is the matrix, if you will, is the mother, is the origin, point of origin. If we can see that as it is taking place, if our attention is wise radical attention is sharp enough and fast enough where we can actually detect it at that point of origin we see it observe it deeply then the stitching comes apart the seamstress fails we see things for what they are and you, you've heard me say the term from Lord Buddha, yata bhutang pajanati, the person sees the way things are coming to be, things are happening, as they're happening, without adding anything to it. 
because the person catches them at their point of origin, catches them. Because the person also sees the impermanence in it. This is happening fast and it's happening constantly. And I have no control over this. I have zero control over this. So this is going to happen. Yeah, it's going to happen. Okay, so where is Atta in all of this? Where is this personhood? Where is this sense of identification in all of this? There isn't one. There isn't one. There was never a need for that. But it was the craving that was creating the illusion that there is a person feeling or responding or receiving this contact where the contact was landing upon, if you will. And there's understanding that. Because impermanence, anicca, suffering or dukkha or anatta, these are not just concepts to be intellectually understood, deciphered, sat down and, you know, written a dissertation on, argued over or something. They are to be seen by the wise, meaning the ones who are fast enough to capture this as it's happening. The ones who are invested enough to go deep in their observations, spending the time in sharpening the tool called sati. So things don't happen haphazardly. They will not happen like that. where realization or wisdom just falls into our laps or we trick our way in to gain understanding. So our investment here is our effort in making sure there is a continuous flow of wise radical attention, yoni so manasikara throughout our waking hours and everything else in between so that we can watch and go deep into the observation. So when this was said, another bhikkhu said this to his fellow senior bhikkhus. This is another one, uh, another interpretation uh, of, the, of the verse. Friends, the past is the one end. The future is the second end, and the present is the middle, whereas craving is the seamstress. Again there's an acknowledgement that craving is the seamstress in this verse. It is craving that keeps stitching for him a new re-becoming here and there. Friends, by knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood. And as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, he thereby puts an end to suffering. We forget that even the present moment has nothing in it that can be grabbed onto, held onto. That is when the person has the deep insight to see through it. With sati, with especially yoni so manasikara, as you're moving, let's say even san, uh, sampajanya with wise, uh, continuous awareness, full awareness of the body moving in time and space. Well, you were there, now you're here. You're going to be there in a minute. Observing these, spending the time and energy looking at these different states and how they have an impact on our understanding of life. The present moment, is there anything in it that I can really grasp? No. That's why craving comes in and always has something to say about the past in relation to the future, because the present, apparently for craving, for the seamstress, is rather boring. Because it's, it's, it's constantly slipping through 
its fingers. There's nothing for it to pitch a tent with on. There's nothing to build on, but it can build on fears of the future, disappointments of the past, successes of the past, hopes for the future. And this is where the Sankaras really have a blast. Sanyas come in, memories, mental associations, memories of the past, thoughts and conjurings about the future. And now we are in, back in Papancha land. Completely cut off from the present. Just like earlier, it was cessation that was removed. In this case, the present is being removed because seamstress comes back in the craving and stitches the past and the future together where the person is no longer living in the present. And they're totally unaware of what is happening with reality. So when we're giving up the present, we're basically signing our prison papers of victimhood to the past and the future, or whichever one is the most dominant. And all that talk about be here now and the present moment, this and that, when you dig deep enough and analyze, it's just the concepts of the past, the hopes of the future, the images that we have conjured up, the imaginings that we have, manyana that we have, as to what we think should be happening, all under the guise of, yes, I am living in the moment, pseudo-spirituality. Because there is no depth of understanding of going penetratively, going deep into phenomena. And our contribution to our suffering is not being looked at honestly. So when this was said, another bhikkhu said this to his fellow senior bhikkhus. Friends, pleasant feeling is the one end. Painful feeling is the second end. And neither painful nor pleasant feeling is the middle. Meaning the neutral feeling is the middle. Whereas craving is the seamstress. It is craving that keeps stitching for him and you re-becoming here and there. Friends, by knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood. And as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, he thereby puts an end to suffering. Lord Buddha, again and again, in this, this kept on saying how putujanas, or uninstructed, undisciplined, worldling, who doesn't have a clue of the experience of, or, or understanding of some level of Dhamma knowledge, who doesn't practice sila, and is not interested deeply in any of it, putujana basically, when a putujana is touched, which by the way are the majority of us human beings, when a putujana or uninstructed worldling is touched by a pleasant feeling, they delight in it. They are lost in it. They enjoy it. They bask in it. They love it. But when they are hit with the painful feeling, they hate it, they're repulsed by it, they abhor it, they are disgusted by it, they run away from it. Hmm. So what you have then is a situation of a seesawing constantly. It's like the pendulum from one extreme to the next. And if you've lived on this planet for even a day, you know that pleasure doesn't stay.
And as the person finds themselves on the other end of the pendulum, now they are seeking desperately to maximize their chances so that they can regain that state of pleasure somehow. So and there's no way of escaping, by the way. And Lord Buddha described three types of feelings. The basic form of his interpretation of feelings we have are the three feelings type, feeling types. One is the pleasurable, the other one is the painful, and there's the third one, which is the neither painful or pleasurable, pleasurable or painful one. So in short, it's neutral. Now, each of these has its own uh, hidden tendency that animates it, if you will. The pleasure-seeking uh, drive, the hidden tendency for pleasure, the thing that impels it, pushes it, propels it, drives it is lust or greed. Sometimes called raga, sometimes called uh, lobha. Raga usually is for passion or lust, and loba is usually used for greed, wanting, wanting, wanting. So that is the thing which animates your wish to experience pleasure. What about the second feeling? Painful. Well, the hidden tendency underneath the painful feeling is the presence of hatred the pushing away, the desire to push away. Now, for the third one, which is interesting, because oftentimes people ask, that, what is a neutral feeling? What is neither pleasurable uh, neither uh, or nor painful feeling? So many teachers have a difficulty responding to that. Well, the basic explanation that Lord Buddha gives, and also Bhante Nyanananda is excellent at uh, explaining these, especially this sutta. A wonderful book of his is... Uh, is um, uh, the miracle of contact and also is uh, uh, wealth, uh, treasure trove of, of, of Dhamma explanation uh, found in his series of talks given in the Law of Dependent Arising series, which I'm currently actually uh, narrating, uh, making it available on YouTube. So um, in it, he explains beautifully uh, the differences between these three feelings, but coming back to the neutral feeling, well, the hidden tendency for that is ignorance. Ignorance. Staying in the darkness of delusion. But ignorance of what? Why ignorance? It is ignorance of the fact uh, that Impermanence is happening constantly, either neglecting to see it or choosing not to see it. Because you're too busy jumping from, you know, seesawing from one thing to the next. The painful, because that is very consuming, energy consuming, because you're rushing away from this house that's on fire because you hate it whatever experience it might be, but for you, it feels that bad. You rush and run away from it. Towards what? The other extreme. Pendulum, back and forth, back and forth. So long as we're in that process, there's no way for us to enter Nibbana, to experience Nibbana. Meanwhile, the neutral feeling if it is done right, if it is looked at penetratingly with insight, we can see that it itself can turn into a doorway to Nibbana. How? Remember the thing I just mentioned about impermanence? The moment you have a neutral feeling, which by the way, is the majority of the time that you're feeling something, you're not always feeling pleasure. You're not always feeling pain. Generally speaking, most people. The majority of the time is actually neutral feeling that we're having, but we just wanna, it's too boring. It's too tasteless. It's too flavorless. It's too bland. We just like, ugh. 
give me some spice, give me some passion, give me some life there. Hence, in comes what? Pleasurable feelings or painful feelings. It could be thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future, and now we are lost in, yes, la la land of Papunjas. Meanwhile, we lost an opportunity to look at that neutral feeling and say, hmm, this too is impermanent, whatever's happening. Because the neutral feeling is not going to suck you in. Because there is no lust underneath. I mean, there's, there's no opportunity for lust. But an opportunity is being lost nevertheless. And that is the opportunity to see through impermanence, which the neutral feeling provides. Unfortunately, the seamstress comes and chops that off as well. So now you have nothing but pleasurable experiences on one end, closely stitched together with the opposite, the painful one. And so long as that state of affairs is, is underway, the person is never going to get the opportunity to experience right view, which is typically what is explained or expressed when we're referring to the first stage of awakening, meaning sotapatti. When you hear the right view, it's not just the first rung of the Eightfold Path. Obviously, that we have to look at the context, where it's being used, how it's being used. But generally speaking, in the suttas, when it's being mentioned, it is setting the person apart from all putujanas. Because the person has seen through. They have penetrated with insight. They have seen impermanence. Even in something as dismal or as, as boring as the neutral feeling. So this should be an opportunity for us to look at neut so-called neutral feelings as in a, in a new light, instead of being tossed in this unending waltz of delight and repulsion. So when this was said, another bhikkhu said this to his fellow senior bhikkhus. Friends, name, or nama, is the one end. Form, or rupa, is the second end. Marupa. And consciousness is in the middle. Where craving is the seamstress. It is craving that keeps stitching for him a new re-becoming here and there. Friends, by knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood. And as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, he thereby puts an end to suffering. Generally, uh, many have uh, misunderstood the Nama portion of Nama Rupa. Rupa, I've mentioned many times, if you recall, it is a reference for the four primaries, uh, primary elements, datus, uh, uh, the four, um, earth, water, fire, and air. So, um, um, but Nama portion, is often misunderstood, uh, and we owe that to the commenta uh, commentators over the centuries. But to, uh, to properly understand as to what in the suttas Lord Buddha and the Arya Salakas have presented Nama as, we have to go with Vedana, which is feelings. We have to go with con constituent parts of Nama I'm talking about now. So uh, Vedana. Sanya, Sankara, yes, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Vedana, Sanya, uh, attention, yes, and we also have intention, and then we have the lovely contact. But unfortunately, many commentators over the centuries have interpreted as pretty much uh, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana, which is what you see in the five aggregates. So here you have, on the other hand, 
the mention of Nama on one end, Rupa on the other, and in the middle is Vinyana. So how could that be? Well, attention is the driver. Attention is Manasikara. And that is what's missing here. The intentionality or the Sanchetana is missing. When you remove Nama from Rupa by extracting, extricating, pulling out the consciousness part, then there's a strong sense of identification showing up. Instead of looking at the resultant that's taking place. So when we talk about the Panchapadana Kanda, which is the five grabbing aggregates, there's an object, there's a subject, and there's a craving. That's another way of looking at this interpretation of the verse, where this venerable one is talking about Nama, Rupa, and Sanya being pulled out. Uh, I'm sorry, vin Vinyana, or uh, in this case, uh, consciousness is being pulled out. So this is particularly, imp particularly important at the moment of one's death. Because so long as we have Nama Rupa, it's almost guaranteed that there's going to be another birth. Because it is the pull that you've heard me probably say in the past. It's like that arrow that's been pulled on the bowstring and you release your hold that you have on the arrow. Well, because of that taut, that pulled string, the momentum that was built, that's the Nama Rupa here. Because the person has not penetrated through and saw that there was a grabbing here. Grabbing of what? Feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. They've all joined together. That is the Nama group. Joined with what? With the Rupa. Remember the four primaries? The thing, the object, heat. It doesn't have to be fire, that quality. Heat, uh, patavi, which is earth, which is solidity. Air, which is movement, uh, openings. Water, fluidity, coolness. All these you put together and you have phenomena. If you notice, some of you might be able to pick up here the presence or the hint or the smell of the six sense spheres. Because without these four primaries, we can't have the six sense spheres. They, they're coming in a, in a second, you'll see them. But I would like us to look at these uh, interpretations as different renditions of reality. I remember uh, years ago when I was studying in the uh, Fine Arts Academy and a uh, teacher would come and place an object in the middle of the room and we would be surrounding it. Uh, we were doing uh, drawing, uh, basically a pencil drawings of the object, whatever it was. And it was amazing because each of us was capturing a different aspect of this 3D object. Completely different in some cases than, let's say, the one who's on the opposite side of you. So we shouldn't look at them as completely different, especially because you see here again and again, they're talking about the seamstress as none other than craving. So at the moment of death, this really becomes a problem unless the person sees through with the grabbing attitude, the, bra the grabbing of the five aggregates, understanding the breaking them up in mind, at least to see the constituent parts of it. What is Nama? 
Where is my attention? I remember from some of the individuals that I have been close to uh, visiting them at the moment of their death, or at least those few hours or those last days, when you ask them and they're coherent, either they're crying, they don't want to let go, or they're dreaming of joining their loved ones on the other side. Well, that's loudly screaming at you as to where their attention is. where their intention is and what their contact is all about and what their sanya is and how they're feeling. There you go, you have Nama group presented. But we don't necessarily have to look at one's end of life as the opportunity to cut loose from the cycle of samsara because the moment you see through the Nama group and to see it not joined with the involvement of the seamstress. When you see them, that's your point of breaking from sansara. But that doesn't necessarily have to happen at the end of one's life. At any moment, you're able to identify the separation between these two. Nama and Rupa. That is our opportunity, just like in the case of the neutral feeling I was mentioning. That's an opportunity for us to break through. And the person no longer has a fear of death. And that's another reason why they say when a person uh, attains fruit of arahantship, they are experiencing the deathless. And we know this from the accounts of Arahats explaining it, especially in the case of Bhante Nyanananda, who passed a few years ago. He explained this, explains this beautifully in detail. So no more clinging to any name and form because clinging to name and form is what necessitates birth into samsara again and again and again. So when this was said, another bhikkhu said this to his fellow senior bhikkhus. Friends, the six internal se uh, sense spaces are the one end. The six external sense spaces are the second end. The awareness of the six senses, which is consciousness, is the middle. Whereas craving is the seamstress. It is craving that keeps stitching for him and you re-becoming here and there. Friends, by knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood. And as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, he thereby puts an end to suffering. The world is a prisoner of the six sense object. Six sense spheres, in fact. Sphere because you have both the internal and you have the external, meaning the eyes and you have the visual objects. Eyes that work and function and can pick up information and objects that are able to emit light and shape and form. You see them and all of a sudden there's a relationship. Now we are caught up in name and form again within the time, uh, limits of time and space. So again, we are dealing with the discrimination between two things, two things, eyes in relation to visual objects, sounds in relation to the ears. So basically consciousness is based on duality. You need to have that duality. But the moment the person sees the impermanent nature in all of this, their unreliable nature, the empty promises, if you will, that they're constantly making, suddenly there is cessation. It's the end. You see here also the connection, which is what I'm trying to do here 
the connection between the different interpretations that each of the senior bhikkhus was present or is presenting here. Earlier, we were talking about contact, of course, then we talked about temporally, past, future, and present. And then we are talking, uh, we talked about a pleasure, painful, neutral, and now we're talking about the, uh, the, uh, the six sense spheres. So you see how it's the same, <laughs> isn't it? After all, you have the seamstress coming in and doing her magic, stitching things up. Meanwhile, consciousness is being given legitimacy with the help of the sannyas. Consciousness is being kept alive by memories, by thoughts, associations. That's how we can keep the story going, right? We try to avoid having any breakups, any cut points, any, any uh, discrepancies in animation if there's a uh, alteration in the speed of the FPS or frame per second. Suddenly there is this glitch, we call it strobing. When I used to do animation years ago, uh, where it has to be 24 frames per second in order for the eyes, the consciousness to say, oh yes, this is a, a dog running, a, a horse galloping. But the moment you drop it down to 23, to 22, 21 frames per second, suddenly there's, your consciousness is no longer being fooled. You're seeing separate consciousnesses, different still shots, different frames. But the mind that doesn't have sati is always, always working hard to make sure that consciousness is presented as one stream, one single unbroken chain. You can call it me, myself, mine. This is who I am. These are my likes. These are whatever I dislike, etc., etc. So you're fooled. Meanwhile, there's no single story because every time you try to grasp, you reach out towards one of these six sense objects, they are receding. It's like that, uh, if you've ever seen a mirage, if you've ever been out in the desert or deserty area, you, you look and it's, if it's really hot in the day, you see a mirage and it looks like water. The animals, the, the deer that's, thirsty will look and say, oh, there's a, there's a water pond, something. But the moment you rush and rush and get try to get close to it, the more it recedes, runs away from you, fades away. The wise person will stop and ask, why is this happening? Instead of run even faster, because that's what a putujana does. Just like going from one end of the pendulum to the next, faster and faster, 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 so you run away from the displeasurable or painful. The wise person is saying, hold on, hold on, I'm tired of this back and forth seesawing. What's going on? And the moment the person is asking these questions means that the person is close to understanding dukkha mindfully. And that is where there is a hope that the person would experience Nibbana. Because now you have the presence, the beginning, the beginnings, the blossoming of wisdom in the person. Because you're seeing that, wait a minute, all these things that I'm running after, they're receding, they're vanishing, they're slipping through my fingers. Why? And why am I stupidly still continuing on doing it? And that's why when a person has dispassion arise in their heart, disenchantment, because of seeing this as a result, this is what's going to happen. And I keep saying this to students when they first come wanting to learn the Dhamma, practice the Dhamma, taste its fruits. I say, well, be careful what you wish for. Are you ready for the disenchantment? Because that's coming if you do it right, according to what Lord Buddha taught without changing anything. Are you ready? Because what that also entails is you're going to find yourself becoming more and more 
in this case, you will recede from those interests, including friends, social circles, who are resonating at a different, a different frequency, if you will, because they are still running after the mirage, despite the suffering. And you're going to try to so hard to try to point this out to them. They will not listen. Will that affect you? Will that discourage you? Because ultimately, with wisdom, you will be able to untie that knot that the seamstress has built at the end of that string, which is what's allowing the stitching to happen between these two pieces of fabric or two, two things, two ends. You know, there's the eyes, visual forms, past, future. There needs to be a knot. Because the sewing machine or the seamstress relies on that. But what happens if the knot is off? It is untied. You pull it, it just slips through. You pull those two pieces of fabric and all of a sudden there is no seam. They're not stitched together. Why? Because there isn't that craving that is pulling you towards that mirage. The jig is up. You got sick and tired of the receding action of constantly looking in your, at your hands and your palms and they're empty. It's like, why am I doing this? And you start probing and you get your sati and your manasikara to become more and faster and faster, more and more rapid in catching what's happening, all these tricks. So the Arahant's mind is no longer caught up in this seesawing action because there's no more upadana, no more grasping, no more grabbing. And there is no seam anymore. So when this was said, another bhikkhu said this to his fellow senior bhikkhus. Friends, self-identification is the one end. The origin of self-identification is the second end. And the cessation of self-identification is the middle. Whereas craving is the seamstress here. When I translated self-identification, um, what I'm talking about here, what I'm trying to capture here is that term that oftentimes is, is misused. Um, anatta or uh, atta in this case, self-identification or uh, in Pali, we have the term sakkaya ditti. Uh, so that's what I tried to capture here, self-identification. Uh, whereas craving is the seamstress. It is craving that keeps stitching for him a new re-becoming here and there. Friends, by knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood. And as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, he thereby puts an end to suffering. Whatever is happening as a result of contact, the world has taught us life our surroundings have taught us that this is happening because of the self. You can think about it in terms of object and subject relationship or personality view, which is what I mentioned earlier, Sakkaya Ditti, which is the first Sangyojana or fetter that will drop. It will no longer have its hold on the person for the first time in their existences throughout sansara, when the person attains sotapatti, when the person becomes a noble disciple, meaning a, one, uh, a, a, a stream winner, a stream winner, the person has seen the Dhamma. They know, they know now, they have the spark. And that sense of identification, self-identification is no longer there. There's an understanding of self, of course, but uh, many people mis misinterpret that, mistranslate this. So, uh, so yeah, 
Uh, again, it's the same thing, the cessation of uh, self-identification. You can also remove uh, the sense of self-identification. You can replace it with, let's say, uh, the contact and the arising of contact and the cessation of contact here. It's the same thing. It's, it's just the, the venerable one is using Sakaya Ditti versus uh, Passa, uh, which is contact. So uh, now they, uh, they've all shared <laughs> their own interpretations of what, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> what they think they surmise Lord Buddha has intended in giving that uh, short verse to uh, that uh, Brahmin. And let's see what they say. When this was said, another bhikkhu said this to his fellow senior bhikkhus. Friends, we have now all shared our interpretation of this verse given by the Blessed One, according to each of our individual understanding. Let us now go and approach the Blessed One and report all this to him. And as the Blessed One explains the intended meaning of his verse, we shall remember and bear it in our hearts and practice according to it. Having collectively agreed to the suggestion made, the senior bhikkhus went and approached the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they all sat to one side and proceeded to inform the Blessed One of their earlier discussion, as they followed up with a question. Bhante, who among us has spoken well? <laughs> like children, you know, which one was, was right? <laughs> bhikkhus, in a way, all of you have spoken well. But, bhikkhus, listen attentively to learn the intended meaning behind the response I gave in the following verse to the questions of Mitteya, as found within the Parayana Bhagda. He who, having understood both ends, the one with wisdom, who does not get attached to the middle, it is he whom I call a great man, for he has bypassed the seamstress in this world. Yes, Bhante. We will listen and attend carefully to the Blessed One in order to learn its intended meaning, those bhikkhus replied. Then the Blessed One said this, bhikkhus, contact is the one end. The arising of contact is the second end. The cessation of contact is the middle. Craving is the seamstress. It is craving that keeps stitching for him a new re-becoming here and there. Friend, uh, Bhikkhus, it should say. By knowing this much, the bhikkhu can thoroughly know and understand what should be thoroughly known and understood as he experiences what should be experienced here and now, and thereby putting an end to suffering. So, so, so. I remember when I was a child, uh, my grandmother used to have her stitching gear. She had many, many uh, stitching needles and, but she had a very bad eyesight. She had also glaucoma, uh, intense, a severe case of glaucoma. And uh, what she would do, she would hand them over to me, especially when she was trying to stitch. Uh, I don't know how she would do it, but she would do it. She had those uh, thimbles, I think that it's called, uh, to protect her fingers. And, uh, she uh, would hand me these, you know, uh, strings and threads, and, and she would ask me, go ahead and put them through the needle, uh, the hole in the, the, the needle, stitching needle, so that she would have them ready to go. <laughs> and uh, so I would do that, and I would watch her how she would stitch things together. And uh, I remember a few times I tried and I tried without having turn, you know, made a knot at the end of one side of the string. And as I would stitch through, go through the fabric, and I would pull it, and all of a sudden the string would come out and the fabric would be intact. No stitching took place. No bonding took place. Why? Because there was no knot at the end of the string. The arahant is a person who no longer has that knot. 
Yes, there are objects to be seen. There's, there are e eyes that are seeing the objects. But as the Arahant walks away from the scene, it is over. And that's another reason why Arahants live always in the present. They don't think it. They don't will it. It's just happening because of the absence of the seamstress. <laughs> so if you think of it, um, if you've ever used a sewing machine and uh, the, the, the thread, the threading, the string, whatever you want to call it, it runs out. And the needle is going back and forth, up and down, up and down. Even though you're going through the pieces of fabric, whatever it is that you're trying to uh, stitch or sew, after the needle has gone through, you pull them apart. You just pull it out and you, they come apart. It's beautiful that Lord Buddha you has used the, the image of a seamstress because it brings so many things to mind. It makes it more palatable. Especially, I'm very grateful for the fact that these venerable ones have given us the, their own purview individually as to how they see this. This is a wonderful sutta. And it's sad that it's not talked about. Uh, it's not explored. It's not discussed. And it's teachings not practiced. So, the sense of identification is there when we're placing that knot at the end of the string. Led by sankharas, our habitual tendencies, the things which drive us. That's why we have these images, these perceptions, these memories, these concepts, these papanchas. Why? Because they're impelled. Uh, the image that comes to mind is like when a surgeon goes, uh, gets ready, prepped up to go into surgery, and they come out with their hands, you know, washed or whatever, and the nurses get their gloves ready, and they squeeze their fingers, their hands through the gloves. The hands, the image that I'm getting is like the sankaras coming in. And all of a sudden, they're moving the memories, the sannyas, as they want you to, because it's a habitual tendency. That's the drive. And all of a sudden, even your thoughts, propensities, proclivities, what are we top heavy in? And how we view the, uh, the world. Lord Buddha says how, <laughs> when I read this first, I was like, what? <laughs> Lord Buddha says uh, at one point in the, in the Dhammapada, in one of the verses, actually two of the verses, that we have to kill our samsaric mother and father. We have to kill our samsaric mother and father. I was like, okay, tell me more. What do you mean? <laughs> because the first precept, all Buddhist takers, not to harm or kill. What is this? On top of that, it's a parajika. It's a defeat for a bhikkhu. Well, it's not your mother and father. Lord Buddha says, craving is the mother and ignorance is the father. Those two have to go. Because of them, you keep being reborn because you need a father and a mother to be reborn. There you go. That's your mom and dad right there, responsible for your sansadic existences. And when the person understands correctly the two ends, we end this whole business of stitching up and being sti stitched up. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, it's, it's a, uh, Understanding the relationship we have with the, with the feelings, looking at pleasurable feeling in a different light. One way that Lord Buddha describes us to, uh, encourages us to break free from the feelings is by looking at uh, pain, uh, pleasurable feeling as painful. <laughs> because it's not going to stay, it's suffering induced. 
It brings suffering. There is the dread. An example would be someone who has conquered a country or uh, looted a bank uh, or, or now has made a billion dollars. Well, they're not going to kick their shoes off and just say, yes, now I'm f totally free. No, now they're going to be worried whether somebody's going to come and steal it from them. They're going to lose it. That's suffering, even though the person has that billion dollar amount. And similarly, when you look at a painful feeling, you see it as a thorn in your side, Lord Buddha describes. He's not, we're not being taught to be masochists or sadists or anything like that. We, we are being encouraged to break free from this tendency of being slaves to our feelings, sensations. And instead to look at the opportunity which the neutral feeling presents, opportunity of looking at the fact that there is impermanence happening all throughout the time. And as we do so, wisdom is developed and, cult developed and cultivated. Because it is with wisdom that we will be able to understand consciousness. It's with wisdom that we are going to see that we are behaving very much like you would behave when you go into a movie theater. Lights out. We willingly are sitting there to watch the movie willingly, intentionally present to detach ourselves from the reality that we know exists. So we are walking into the darkness of delusion with our own free will. Willingly wanting to be put to sleep for that time, during that time. Sleep as in unwise state, be deluded. That's one of the reasons why uh, a person who practices insight, a person who has yoniso manasikara, it is impossible for anyone to hypnotize them. Somebody was asking me yesterday uh, about this, and I said, no, it's impossible. You cannot hypnotize someone who has that strong of a sati. It doesn't work. Unless the person relinquishes that. So removing ourselves from the darkness of delusion means you have brought into your life wisdom. And with that wisdom, it is possible to see that the movie that you're about to watch, in fact, it's just a series of still images, still frames, which you have been convincing yourself that it is a single movie. There's an actual actor on the screen. And when the light's back on, nobody wants to look at the blank white screen. We just talk about the movie. Yeah, did you like the movie? Yeah, I liked the movie. I hated the movie or something. Everybody walks away talking about, nobody's looking at the screen which we were mesmerized by for about two hours. What happened to that? The jig is up. So now we are lost in the past. Seesawing. So all of these different renditions or interpretations of these venerable ones, we see how they all link up. They're saying the same thing. And uh, when the person is no longer a victim, uh, like the last time we were talking about the asavas, the mental contaminants, because ultimately those are the main, main key players, the under, underneath it all, the, the main culprits. the deep-rooted asavas. Once the person has the wisdom to see through and understand the nature of consciousness as such, they have removed the veil. They have discovered the presence of the seamstress, which is craving. And that's why they bypass the seamstress. They see the form, they see, ah, the eye. That's the end of it. They bypassed her. But you can never do that unless sati is sharp and fast. 
Bhantin Yanananda uses this example, which I, I think I've shared with you a few times, of table tennis. He says, there's two players. One of them is Mara, and he is serving you very quick serves <laughs> with the ball. Your job is to hit it, be ready. The moment you see it coming, the moment he hits the ball with his racket, and he plays, a, there's a play on words there. Mara's racket. We have to be very quick, quicker than Mara. Mara because there's delusion involved, because we are captives within samsara. But there is a release, as you see here in the sutta, being uh, shown to us in different ways, where we can bypass the seamstress altogether. Even if the person doesn't become an arahant, still, if they just attain sotapati, becoming a stream winner, that's already saying a lot. Because the person now has much higher knowledge than they did before. It is a superior, superlative, level of confidence and faith that was unprecedented never had happened but especially there's a presence of understanding underlined understanding that's unprecedented but it comes to be transformed to its perfection when that person that sotapanna turns into an arahant as we know from the Arahants that and their writings and how they inculcate in us the drive not to give up and to see through the tricks of the seamstress. So I will stop here and I hope uh, this was also for you uh, also a, a, a fun sutta to go over and uh, uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, uh, comments about it, I would uh, welcome share some thoughts together. Thanks very much, Bhante, for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, I recall reading a sutta whereby um, there is a list of things that an arahan is incapable of doing. And apart from the very obvious parajikas and um, precepts. What I uh, found interesting was um, that an arahan is incapable of accumulating material goods for future consumption. And um, I'll take that as he's incapable of planning or preparation for the future. And I also recall that Bhantanyanananda intentionally translates sankara as preparations. Are you done? Yes. Ah, uh, thank you for that mention. Um, uh, it's a, I don't know which reference you're using for the list of uh, qualities that the Narahant no longer has. Uh, there's different uh, sources, so I don't know which one you're using. Uh, but uh, as far as your primary question, as far as retaining things or prepping for something, we've all had goals. We all plan, uh, even if it's a part of a routine. Uh, many of you, uh, go to your jobs, your professions. Many people started going back to their actual job sites uh, versus doing it virtually, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a, a planning involved. You need to sit down and you need to plan what to do next, even if it's something mundane. Now, the problem happens when the person makes the arahant seem otherworldly, as if they are just floating. Uh, that is a dangerous concept. I don't think you were uh, 
hinting at that or inferring that uh, to be the case here. But the overconsumption, with over the, the, the overexertion rather of uh, constantly being lost in, well, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. Even if it's for the Dhamma, if that is there already, it's impossible for the person to become an Arahant. Many people get stuck even at the level of Anaga. Because if you get to the level of Anaga, I mean, the only passion, if you will, that you might have is the Dhamma, for the Dhamma. You live for the Dhamma, but it is a hang-up. It is a preparation, if you will, as Bhantinyananda would say. There is a subtle bhavasava there. There's a subtle desire of something lingering there. There's almost this sense of, I don't want to let go. It's too beautiful. There's an attachment. So if in the case of an anagamin, there's no other interest other than the dhamma, which is the reason why many anagamins end up being reborn into the pure boats. And they never become, uh, well, they don't, not never, they don't become arahants instead while living as a human or during that transition, or at least at landing in the pure boat. Why? Because there's still a smidgen, a tiny little ember left under the ash. But if that anagamin is able to discover that, remove that, and take that ember or those embers and shove them down a cold, icy bucket of water. That's the end of all preparations. So yes, the Arahant, as far as I understand from my research and uh, uh, et cetera, it is not uh, going to allow the Arahant to have the, the, uh, the desire to end up giving so much emphasis or effort, put so much effort on planning things. Because remember, uh, in the book of the fours, the book of fives, and the book of sixes, and uh, I just started the book of sevens, by the way, in the Anguttara and Nikaya. So I just finished the book of the sixes. So I'm sure in the sevens as well, you're going to find a lot. But Lord Buddha talks about the qualities that are necessary to be found in the person in order for them to experience arahanship. And one of them is again and again and again shows up it is seclusion. That's naturally coming into the scene. It's growing. It's part of the disenchantment, the dispassion. It is like home. You want to go there. You don't want company. You give a Dhamma talk and you want to rush back, recover from all that, even though it was Dhamma. So yes, absolutely, I agree that there isn't the need, the investment in preparing. But as far as having goals, this is not a zombie. You're not a vegetable, you're not a hunt. You can have goals. Bhantan Yananada kept writing lovely, lovely books. He kept on going to give Dhamma talks, even though they were pretty much disrespecting him, persecuting him, wanted him out of the monastery. But he would do it as a, as a showing of respect to his teacher, because the teacher had asked him to give the Nibbana series and then also the dependent origination series of talks. So I'm only using him. Same thing with the other Arahans, Ajahn Man or Webu Sayada. He didn't care. Webu Sayada when uh, Ubakin, where the Vipassana tradition originally started, but then it deviated when it, and became something like Goenkaism, 
which is unfortunately turned into something like a cult. I'm sad to say. However, it has brought so many people to the Dhamma that we must also acknowledge because there's genuinely interested individuals who are caring for the Dhamma. And that is a beautiful ground then for them to sprout in there. But I just wanted to mention that. But Uba Kin, when he found out about, uh, who was a lay person, Uba Kin, after World War II, uh, and he had an official position in the government. So had all this ability, all these resources available to him, but he also had the desire to spread the Dhamma because he had learned how to practice Vipassana from his teacher, who was also a lay person. He hears about Webu Sayadaw, and Webu Sayadaw was known to be extremely secluded. And everybody knew that he never had left his tiny little kuti, his village, his temple. He wasn't interested. But Uba King comes and says, Bhante, I would like you, Sayadaw, I want you to uh, come and bless the center that I'm opening on the other side of Burma. <laughs> and his assistants were shaking their heads and saying, it's, it's, come on, it's impossible, forget it. Don't even bring it up to Webu Sayadaw. He doesn't have to ask again because Webu Sayadaw just comes out and says, okay. Even Ubakin is stunned. He takes care of everything, the flights, the transportation, all these things. That's how we also get that phrase from Webu Sayadaw, where he says, do not leave the train, the train to Mandalay, do not leave it. Don't leave your seat. Otherwise, he would have just said, don't leave your kuti. But he was not even attached to just being secluded either. So they don't leave any footprints. Remember that reference that Lord Buddha talks about? Of there are prints or writing that happens on a slab of rock. There's one that is done on, on, on a sand. There's some writing that could be done on water. And then there's the fourth kind, which is done in the air, in the sky. Where are the prints in that? Because all the others, you can actually detect something. Even the water, if you move your hand, it creates ripples. The sand, definitely, but the wind comes and blows it. The rock, that's harder. That stays longer. But what do you do with the fourth kind? And that is the Arahant, Lord Buddha says. So I think the curiosity that one may have as to what is that mind state like? That curiosity could be a wonderful jumping board for the person to go ahead and taste Arahantship for oneself. That's how I would approach trying to address your question. I don't know if I was able to answer. What do you think? Your thoughts? Yes, thanks very much. They're supposed to move us out of the ditch of inertia. These suttas, these talks, the practice itself, whatever it is, they're supposed to inspire us to want to improve upon ourselves, to create wisdom when there isn't that level of wisdom. And that's how we know that was wisdom. I thought that was wise, really? But that itself says so much because you're able now to identify that part of you because you have surpassed it. And that is a, a good feeling that is actually progr uh, progressive. True progress happens in the mind of oneself. And that's why there's no need for conversion. There's no need for persuasion in this path. But wisdom must be developed in order for consciousness to be understood. I have a question here. Uh, Sam, how would you build a strong foundation for a consistent practice if you are still jumping more or less from one thing to the next? Well, 
stay with the object of meditation. Don't keep changing anything. When your teacher gives you something and you want that person to be your teacher, you don't go mid-sentence changing it. Otherwise, it's like if you're living in California, you're driving, you decide to drive down to San Diego, and before you get there by about 15 minutes, you decide, you know what, Monterey or San Francisco is great at this time of the year. And you turn around, do a 180, and drive all the way up five north or something, and you go all the way up. But before you get to Monterey, you say, yeah, but San Diego Zoo is beautiful. They have so many animals. Let me go. That's what's going to happen. Meanwhile, Sansara is there underneath your feet. So when a person takes on a teaching, whether it's the Buddha, whether it's the suttas, and you say, this is the teaching I want to abide by, you abide by it. You don't change anything. You don't mess around. Because what you are dealing with is your ignorance your attachments, your ideas of what it's supposed to be as opposed to what it's not. That's why you take somebody as your teacher. Because you are the student. The student does what? What a student is supposed to. Practices as the teaching is presented to them without changing. But one thing that many people do because of the vast amount of data available today different, uh, for example, YouTube channels, different uh, teachers, different Dhamma talks, if it is just Buddhism, for example. Many people, even Buddhist students uh, these days keep talking about Satguru stuff or Deepak Chopra stuff. What is that? What bunch of nonsense is that? That means you're mixing things up. You're confusing yourself. You're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. San Diego, San Francisco, San Diego, San Francisco. Spinning your wheels for nothing. Meanwhile, precious time is slipping by. So stick to one object, to one technique, the way that it has been presented to you. Until the teacher tells you otherwise. But they won't tell you anything unless you actually practice consistency. That's one of the reasons why I always tell students, don't move when you sit. Stay in that posture for as long as humanly possible. And when you really have to maybe go to the bathroom or something, fine, but do it with awareness. Do it with responsibility. Do it with elegance. Do it with beauty. The presence of manasikara. Have it be there. Make it meaningful. As if it's the very last time you're going to the bathroom. Are you moving your knees gently? Do it gently as if it's going to fall apart. Otherwise, probably it's just restlessness. But it sounds, it feels like it's like the end of the world. It's not. Nobody's going to die. But it feels like it is. Watch the mind. That's where you're already practicing the Dhamma. Because you are looking at the hindrances, and the hindrances become your teachers then. But you have to have trust. First, trust in your own inner goodness, and then trust in the Dhamma. Which means there's doubt. <laughs> That's why we need to bring in trust all the time. Because oftentimes, we go as far as we are po we're, we're acquainted to, we're, we're accustomed to. But that's where if a person, for example, would do 10 push-ups or five or one, for years I thought that my limit was one push-up. As a child growing up, I couldn't even do one actually in my teenage years because I didn't have muscles and I was going from one surgery to the next. Until one day I allowed myself to do one single push-up. And you push it, you push it. And then those two become three, three become four. It's the same thing with the spiritual practice. You need to develop that confidence, which comes only by persistence and consistency. Another question, uh, hi Bhante, behind new, uh, neutral feeling, there is delusion that leads one to think that there is a self, atta. 
Can neutral feeling then be supportive towards the path to Nibbana? Seek clarity. Yes, like I was mentioning about, because the neutral feeling has underneath it the hidden tendency of ignorance, as you also pointed out here. But the clue to the key, rather, the key for identifying and having an understanding of the neutral feeling is seeing the neutrality of feeling to begin with, including uh, the seeing the impermanence of the neutral feeling. Because even the neutral feeling is not going to say new, stay neutral. Sooner or later, it's going to find its way to the one of the opposite extremes of the pendulum. But because it's a longer uh, a stretch of time, meaning because it happens more often, the neutral feeling in our lives, right now you're sitting. Well, when you're sitting, unless you've sat for a long, long time, you're going to feel pain. But otherwise, you're just going to sit. And it's like, yeah, unless you put your mind to that area of your body, that's when it's going to pick up some sensation. Well, what was hap happening before then? It was just neutral. But what happened? Now I'm aware of it. The attention moved. And suddenly you pay attention, they pay attention, and suddenly you see that there's a tiny little twitch. Suddenly, there's an itch. Maybe there's a tension. There's a desire to move. Or something happens, someone comes into the room. All of these are indicative of the presence of impermanence. That impermanence is what is going to dislodge you from your trust, actually blind belief, that life is nothing but a desire, a journey, or an attempt to gain more pleasurable feelings and avoid negative ones. You start seeing the nonsense in that approach and you start to come to a state of restfulness. You start seeing that there is impermanence, impermanence. So there is no point in me handing the, uh, grabbing this, yeah. And that's why coming back to Upatissa's question, that's why the Arahant would not be interested in grabbing onto anything, including Webu Sayadaw, if halfway through the journey to Mandalay, if somebody came and said, sorry, Sayadaw, Mandalay doesn't exist anymore, or the temple has been converted to something else, or Ubakin changed his mind. Do you think he would have fret? They would, they would just become upset, start yelling, kicking, and screaming? No. There's no investment in any of that. It's just there. Because there is the desire to help others to taste the Dhamma. That is there. But how much of an investment is there? Is he completely, uh, is, is he hanging from that? Possibility of it happening? Would he lose his sleep over something? No. That's why the Arahant would never be preparing for anything in that sense. But on the conventional sense, of course, if the Arahant's toothpaste is finished, and the supporters are there, they always come and check. The Arant is not going to say, well, I'm not supposed to be preparing for anything, so I better not say anything about the toothpaste being finished. No, of course, that would be ludicrous. So the Arant has <laughs> common sense. So in that sense, the conventional usage of I, self, Lord Buddha would, would not, not use self. He would use it conventionally. Because people still think that the Lord Buddha said not self. He didn't say that. It was the sense of self-identification that we attribute to experience, the life, object, subject. So I hope that that has uh, helped with these questions. I'm going to have to uh, pause here and uh, because my uh, the body, my body here, is, is tired. Because <laughs> uh, I've been going on for a few hours now. So... But if you do have uh, further questions, so please uh, do send them my way, email them, and I will do my best uh, to answer. Uh, and uh, some of you have asked from overseas whether some of these talks that I've given here last week or one I gave today, earlier, 
uh, would be up available. Yes, they would be, and I asked them, and uh, they have uh, assured me that it would be. Generally, the the time frame is we're talking about. They said one, about a week per video, because they also have to do editing and things. So I'm very appreciative of the time and energy and dedication they are putting in to, to make these available. So you would get to see those talks as well. But I, of course, will, will do this uh, after the retreat. So I noticed that there were some more. Uh, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So let us uh, share some merits. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas, yakkas and dandabhas and kumbhandas, all share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sada, sada, sada. May you be well. May your practice be infused with more momentum because it's only your own effort that's going to get you to experience what it is that Lord Buddha spent 45 years of his life teaching us. That's the only thing that's going to pull you out of the ditch, which is called inertia. And so long as we're not arahants, we are in the ditch. But you're dealing with the worst enemy, and that is the desire to have asati, the opposite of sati, or to make to have the sati be so strong or have, you know, as, as, as just haphazardly taking place here and there, a little bit here. I practice sati in the morning between 10 a.m. and 10 15. That's enough sati for me. So long as that's happening, uh, or so long as your dedication only revolves around your time that you spend on the cushion, even though it might be genuine effort, that's not going to cut it. It takes effort, your effort, your own personal effort to make it happen. We do it in all other endeavors in our lives, except for this. Why is that? So let us put more effort, genuine effort in our practice so that we can get to taste the fruits of the Dhamma ourselves. So that is my wish. And uh, may the Triple Gems blessings be upon you and your loved ones. And uh, may you keep smiling from your heels. <laughs> Until next time. Be well. Secure it.